Welcome everybody to the show. Joining me is our regular co-host, fellow traveler, Dan Dan, the Dan Dan Noodles man, the Vesto Slifer of Wargaming. It's a wonderful world to be alive today. And it's a wonderful world to be alive today. And he's only slightly high. So joining us tonight is our very special guest, uh, Mr. Chuck Seeger. Chuck, thanks for stopping by this evening. We are delighted to have you. Now, Chuck is Thank the designer. It's a wonderful thing being had. Chuck is the designer of uh, the very well-received Zero Leader from DVG from a few years ago. And uh, I think uh, you had Stuka Leader came out in, uh, this Leader past year, year, correct? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we may be talking about that in the future, but we'll leave that aside for now. And then I think you've got uh, some more stuff in the pipeline. So let's uh, let's yeah. start out by asking, uh, how did you get into war games in the first place? Ah, war games. Well, I was always, even when I was a kid, I was uh, always a World War II fan, especially. Um, mainly aircraft, but just generally World War II aircraft. And then uh, Avalon Hill started coming out with some awesome games, um, things like Air Force and that type of stuff. And the next thing I know, I had some friends. We would meet in the social studies prep area at school and start playing. And uh, we had teachers coming and playing and everything else. So I got my start in the early 70s and uh, never stopped. Cool. Yeah, the uh, the classic Air Force uh, originally from Battle Line. Actually, I picked it up mm -hmm. a few years ago. I haven't had a chance to play it yet. It looks pretty cool, though. What, what, what do you mean Battle well, what's Line? The, what's the version I have? The Battle Line. Battle Line was a uh, a war game publisher in the late seventies, maybe early eighties, that was acquired by Avalon Hill. Ah, okay. So therefore, Air Force and Dauntless. They acquired and, a, and a huge list right. of other games. A, a lot of like the really yeah. strong classics from Avalon Hill uh, came out of either of Battle Line or from the designers that Avalon Hill inherited from Battle Line, which was Steve Peake and S. Craig Taylor, the great, the late great S. Craig Taylor. I know that name. You do, because I've talked about the late great S. Craig Taylor on numerous occasions, designer of such classics as Wooden Ships and Iron Men and Flat Top. Ah. Possibly my favorite Avalon Hill game of all time. Really? Yeah, I think so. Did you I think make that's a big box and a small box version of that. No, there's only one version of Flat Top. Okay. They're both both the Battle Line oh, version. Flat Top. Okay. Yeah. I Iron Sights. No, I don't know what you're talking about. Iron Sights and something men. Uh, Wooden ships uh, and Iron Men. There you go. Yes. Yeah. No, that was in the same flat box, the same one inch flat Avalon Hill flat box, and very similar uh, Battle Line box at that. So, but we didn't have Chuck out to talk about Battle Line. We could. If S. Craig Taylor was alive, I would want him on the show, but he is not. I, so. I, I want to ask Chuck a, a, a question. If, if that's okay. Yes, Chuck, please participate. How did, how did you... Why DVG? What happened for you to go to DVG? Which, um, which, which I think is an amazing fit. Thank you. Um, I do too. They're, they're great people. A lot of fun. Corsair Leader... Uh, when it was on Kickstarter, I got involved in the Kickstarter and I had a friend who, um, also was involved in that. And he and I started having fun back and forth in the Kickstarter doing all that kind of stuff. And it just, it snowballed to where I got really into that Kickstarter, got to know Kevin very well and the whole shooting match. Um, and then when that game came out, played it, absolutely loved it, but thought, there's a couple things here that could be better and whatever. So I contacted Kevin and said, Hey, you know, I love, um, I love Corsair leader, but I would like to do one from the Japanese side and zero leader and add uh, this and that and do these other things or whatever. And I don't think he believed that I would do it, but I whipped it together. I whipped the original together really quickly and then we worked out a bunch of the rules. So, the rest, as they say, is history. We became really good friends and uh, been out to California to see him a couple of times, and, which from Wisconsin isn't, I can't, it's not just walking out my door. Um, so I've been out there a couple of times. <laughs> not and, not and, today, and, it's not. Not today. Oh, man. No, they're not going anywhere tonight. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a great time. It's wonderful working with them. Uh, you know, just, you know, talking about the weather, which I'm not a weather type of guy, I'm more of an existential uh 
philosopher, <laughs> philosopher and uh, plumber yeah, that's, guy. Yeah, that's one way to put it. <clears throat> now, it's cute how Americans, you know, are like, there's a bit of snow and it's like, ooh, I can't do shit. Hey, Americans, grow up. You're talking about Texas, Dan. We're not in Texas. I got about two inches of snow here in Ohio, and other than it causing my back to lock up when I went outside, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> and, 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 and we, uh, we just got finished cleaning up uh, 18 inches, which was on top of five inches two days before mm -hmm. that. So, oh, mm -hmm. holy cow! Right, right now it's below zero with a uh, wind chill of probably negative 20. Yeah, they're they're serious about it in Wisconsin. Just so you know, we didn't, get that, we didn't get that weather here yet. Uh, well, where's here? Uh, I'm in Montreal. Ah, uh, okay. More or less. That's why. Yes. Uh, and, and and okay, sorry, sorry. There, I'm I'm a Montrealer, and you know, um, Chuck. Going back to the 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 Versons, they really are the salt of the earth people. These guys, eh? Very nice. Yep. It's, very, it's, it's incredible. It's almost there. gross. Yep. Yep. It's almost gross yeah, how nice is, they uh, are. Yeah. Kevin is, Kevin is absolutely wonderful. Uh, the first time I went out there was just to meet them, and we hung out and we spent all day together, had a great time. And then the second time was for Kevin's wedding. Um, so we got to hang out with them for a weekend. And they're just great people. Just yeah, really, really I know. nice people. And Kevin. We'll decide we're going to need a 10-minute conversation to talk about, especially Stuka leader. We needed to talk, so we're going to make this appointment. We're going to talk for 10 minutes, and two and a half hours later, we remember what it was we wanted to talk about, so then we go back to that <laughs> for about 10 minutes. So we just have a blast talking about That's it. And great. Sometimes That's great. We actually great. come up with decent rules when we do it. So, You know, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of nice people in California. I know one guy, Carl Kreider from the war game boot camp. He's a bit of a son of a bitch, but he's a nice guy. You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh he's here. He's Shut here. Up. Right. Yeah. Big, big, zip it up, Dan. Sorry. So Chuck, you mentioned Corsair leaders specifically, and I know that yeah. Dan had done the, the, you know, had been, had been doing the series for quite a while by the time Corsair leader came out. So, so what features of that system, if, I, I, I really kind of feel like it's more of a family of games than a unified system, and you could feel free to correct me on or elaborate on that if you want. But what kind of features of that system attracted you to it in the first place? Well, I, the um, Corsair leader really attracted me again to World War II aircraft, okay? Mm -hmm. Pacific Theater, Corsairs, uh, you get the, you know, the F-4F. Wildcat, those kinds of aircraft and that type of thing, that just that just really excited me. Um, I played IAF leader, Phantom leader, uh, Thunderbolt Apache leader, all those. I'm not that much into the modern, but those are really fun games. So I think you're right. There we go. There he is. He is, is prepared. I didn't even brief him on this. <laughs> Yeah, one of my favorite games. But we um, we are a family. You know, some people say, oh, just buy whatever game because they're the exact same except for the cover of the box or that kind of stuff. And that is definitely not true because what I changed from Corsair Leader to Zero Leader and then what I changed from Zero Leader to Stuka Leader and now what I'm changing from Stuka to Mustang, yes, we're in the family. But I, I am really getting to be like that crazy uncle that nobody wants to talk about in the family. You know, just, I show up and do things and blow everything up, and then away we go. I mean, I figured for Stuka Leader, after Zero Leader, you just put all the armor back on the plane, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But, you know, the big, they had to do some things with it. You know, uh, number one, had to change it because maintenance was never a problem for the Germans where that was a major problem for the Japanese. So maintenance is a huge thing in Zero Leader. But in Stuka Leader, maintenance isn't really a problem, but now we start talking about fuel and things like that that become a problem. So it was a matter of what type of problems are you going to have to face as a commander? Are you going to have to face with this or that? So we've got that, and then the better and better the aircraft got was was something else too. Um, one of the things that I, one of the big things I changed 
which is really hard to believe, but in Corsair Leader, no matter whether you're in Pearl Harbor, you know, in 41, or if you're attacking the Japanese mainland in 45, right, you have the exact same, exact same starting um, squadron and everything else, right? In Zero Leader, what I started to do is reflect the way the squadrons got worse and worse throughout the year. So at the start of the year, you've got a really strong, uh, really strong squadron, a couple of veterans and that type of thing. At the end of the war, now you're dealing with a lot more newbies and greens and that kind of stuff. So it really reflects the changing uh, dynamics that the Japanese and the Germans faced. Chuck, and Mustang um, is going to be the exact opposite. You're going to start with kind of weak pilots and end up with much stronger pilots at the end of the war. And in case oh, we yeah. haven't said, uh, hold on one second, Dan. Mustang leader is going to be your next title from DVG, correct? Correct. There you go. We were Dan, going go ahead. To, we were going to kickstart it uh, just a little bit before Christmas. And I talked to Dan and said, you know, we could bring it out now. But number one, I'd like about another month or two to actually finish it, get some more uh, things done so that when we do kickstart it, it's going to be basically ready to go. Um, and I also wanted to wait till after the holidays. So Mustang is going to come out to Kickstarter in April at this point. Okay. Okay. So pretty uh, soon then. Yes. Uh, uh, Ch <clears throat> Chuck, when, um, yeah. what type of games did you play before you, you got into designing these zero, the leader uh, stuff from Dan? Um, I played an awful lot of, like I say, Air Force Dauntless, um, Wings of Glory, Wings of War, Check Your Six, those types mm. of games. Um, it's really cool. I, I just like them. And they're all different, if you would like, complexity layers, all right? So Wings of Glory, Wings of War is a relatively simple game, all right? Uh, you put your maneuver card in front of your airplane, you move it, and if you get a shot, they pull a damage card. There's no two hit numbers or do anything like that. Well, check your six takes that another step up. So now you have uh, damage and you've got to change or you got to roll to sh save yourself, those types of things. And then Air Force Dauntless went even further because now you have to bank your aircraft, how much power do you have on, on and on. So I used to love playing those games, used to play Midway with my, my friend. Mm -hmm. We We'd start playing Friday after school and finish up sometime late Sunday afternoon. We would play uh, Midway and Luftwaffe and uh, the old SPI game Spitfire. Mm. That was that was really cool. I Luftwaffe was a like a hobby cornerstone. It's it's one of those yeah. games that if you started playing at the right time, that was like definitely one of the games you started playing. Absolutely, and it's and it's really good. It's a little too abstract, I guess, for me, but it, it's really, really good. Um, Luftwaffe? Luftwaffe. Yeah, that, that, you found that uh, uh, abstract, uh, Chuck? Oh, I think he's uh, I think he's frozen. I think Chuck that, may have, Chuck may have froze a little bit. Uh, but it's not it's not anything that Dan did this time, so don't no, worry I didn't about do it. Nothing. I'll assume well, it will on, recover. On. I got my Italian friend, Vinge. Vincenzo. Yeah, but if you know, it, it, it's colloquially Italians, Vince, you know, Vince. There you go. There you go. Uh, Carl mentions uh, the op the sort of sem. I, I, I maybe I'll use the word grand tactical. That doesn't mean anything for those games. Burning Blue is a little more operational, I think. Uh, uh, I don't know about Bloody April. I don't have Bloody April. I mean, I got a different Bloody April. That Bloody April, but that's a different Bloody April. Right. He's talking not, about Lee Birmingham Wood. It's not even the same war. Yeah, that's a that's a Richard Berg masterpiece right up there. Is it really? So, no, not not really. No. It's not what of regarded as one of his, his classics, but but the sister game Terrible Swift Sword absolutely is. So how, how, how do how, how do I believe you going on here, Artie? You know what I'm saying? You know I'm gullible and you just I, apparently yeah I have a amazing deadpan delivery that everybody just believes what I tell them. That's just Sangram that's a weird thing. Aron. I am incredibly persuasive apparently. So, so since I'm incredibly persuasive, folks, let me remind you, there's a link to my affiliate link at Noble Knight. 
help us get all the way to uh, campaign for North Africa. Hopefully, you Chuck. Know, these guys, these noble knight guys, there, Dan, Dan Letter, and all that. You know, it. They're Chuck's nice. re Chuck's rebooting, by the way. He's rebooting. I didn't know he was a robot. Well, his computer's rebooting. Hey, uh, Artie, do you have any of DVG games? Zero leader, all kinds of leaders. I don't have any of the leader games. I had something from DVG. I've got uh, uh, Field Commander Napoleon, which is a fabulous game, by the way. And so. the thing is, is about these these leader games. If I'm on the second floor on a balcony and I drop this on someone's head, it's gonna hurt because these are massive, heavy games. Oh yeah, no kidding. I mean, Field Commander Napoleon is so is so tough it broke my counter clipper. You know what? That's I'm a not great even kidding. Game. That really is a great system, great game, lots of fun. What can I tell you? Yeah. You so. don't like just by your yeah. I know you don't like it. No, no, Dan, I'm running the show here. I got buttons to push, and I'm waiting for Chuck to come back. Oh, you're back. pushing buttons, baby. He'll be back in a second. I'm pushing your buttons, little man. How come you don't answer all my emails, eh? Let's what do you bring mean? it out in the open here. Let's I answer, bring it out in the open. I, I answer most of your emails. Yeah. Except the yeah, ones I do. delete, of course, unread and unopened, and the ones that go automatically to spam filter. Oh, it's just Dan. It's just his dad's talking about his toilet again. I can ignore this safely. Well, I mean, I could talk about my toilet now, you know, uh, fill up the dead time. You could, if it's dead air, but I, we could keep us busy uh, not talking about your toilet since I believe all of the viewers this evening will already have learned more about your toilet than they needed to know. Ah, uh, these guys, these guys, uh, they, they, they love me. They just, you know, it's a, they, what do you, uh, what, what is it? They, they, uh, it's hard love. That's what these guys are doing, hard love. There are some there are some changes in the TSS remake from TSR some rules changes um, but the biggest change was just they redid the map cuz the, presumably they didn't have the nicer graphics that SPI had done. Um I wouldn't say they ruined it but boy that map's ugly. It's 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 really ugly. So Marty, what did you just put up there before there you had a you had a <coughs> excuse me. You had a <coughs> um a graph, a graph of something like. Oh, that. this is the this. I gotta pull it back up now. Hold on, because it's on a different show. This is the campaign for campaign for North Africa. I'm 13 percent of the way towards getting a copy of campaign for North Africa. What does that mean? That means that if people use my affiliate link to Noble Knight, that's in the comments, and I get a little bit of that, and eventually it builds up to enough for Still me to buy a copy of campaign for North Africa. Is it available? It's the, the it's the they actually don't have one in stock right now, but they will have one in stock at some point. It's not uh, it's not going to take them that long. They're very good over there at Noble Knight. Here's Chuck back. Chuck had some technical difficulties, but he is back now. Ah, you missed it, Chuck. We were talking about my toilet. We we were, and you, 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 you'll be you'll be better always, off I having missed it. Good, I always miss the good stuff. Yeah. Oh no, that's not the yeah, good I stuff was, in this case. Hey, I was going to ask you, Chuck. Yep. Chuck, I was going to ask you. So when you first designed, what well, your first game was what? Was was uh, Zero? Uh, yeah, that's for correct. DVG. Okay. <clears throat> yes. So basically, the leader... Yeah, the I did leader a lot games, of small games for my family, but... Okay, the leader games has a system, right? Like Dan's system. So you had to incorporate right. your ideas right. into that system because... He obviously wants to keep uh, some sort of uh, continuance in the thing. Did you find that difficult to adapt to your ideas? Uh, let's say Dan found it difficult to adapt to my ideas. Um, I, some of yeah. the stuff that, um, yeah. I wanted to do was like, well, we've never done that in a Stuka game and this type of thing. And so there, there were long discussions with Kevin and long discussions with Dan about, about that. And that was in Zero, we had that. And then Stuka, when we had the ME-110, which was something entirely different, that has forward firing guns plus a rear gunner. Now, none of the World War II uh, leader games had something like that. And they're like, Whoa, what? You know, that, that just completely blew their mind that we had uh, that kind of an aircraft and 
how can we work this to make that work? So, yeah, I think um, there is some limiting factors because there is some canon you want to stay with that keeps it a leader game, but I have definitely expanded that envelope, which I, I love doing, okay, because what I want is I want these games, you know, Air Force Dauntless is not a very accessible game. That's a game you've got not to be committed to. Enough. You've got to spend a bunch of time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, I don't like these it's, games. I don't want these games to do that. I want it's these pretty games complicated. to be a lot of fun, but I also want them to be historically accurate, you know, and I want them I want them to be quick playing, but I also want them to be not all luck, you know, which is how you can make a quick yeah. game. Uh, is that sort of uh, so? Uh, Brian Salahor, uh, Byron Salahor here, asks, uh, makes a, an interesting observation about that sort of bullseye map that he first saw in Patton's Best. Is that a common feature to the DVG leader games? That's yeah. that sort of built-in perspective in the map where you kind of you are the the plane, right? I have not seen them all, so I was not yeah. sure if that was the well, case, and I haven't looked at any of the modern ones. Yeah, the, the difference. Yeah, you you're not like in Patton's best or whatever. You're one tank, so it's easy to um, it's easy to arrange it so that the world moves around your one tank. But in the leader games, you're not. You could have up to eight aircraft flying, so you can't make it go around you like that. In answering to stack stacking limit, yes, I am a pilot. Um, ah. So, we have the I'm a, I'm a private pilot that's my it's my handle but anyway um we took that and inverted it like he says and now you put the target um target card in the center and you go after that uh, that doesn't that's not the way thunderbolt apache works they they have a morph a morphing board that you go around and bomb but all the rest of them are like this i changed it a little bit in stuka leader uh, because now this is one of those other things I've added that they don't have in the other leader series games. I added that the targets move. So in other words, if you're intercepting bombers, they don't just sit in the center and wait for you to get there. They start on one side and they're coming towards you and you only have a couple of couple of turns to knock them down. And the same with um, an interceptor where you're going up and you're having a dogfight. They don't just sit in the middle and wait for you to come and maneuver around them. They're all over the board. So you've got to split up and go after them and do all that type of thing. And then one of the really fun things I added with um, Stuka Leader is the uh, bogey, no bogey rule. Uh, so you don't know who you're fighting. You don't know what you're fighting until you actually engage it. So you see a bogey, so you know there's an enemy plane there. But he's moving across the board towards you and when you intercept him that's when you find out that um it is a veteran pilot in a fox wolf and you're a newbie flying you know a p-38 or something and you go oh crap i really shouldn't have picked that one but it, it adds a whole different thing because one of my friends glenn who was on here earlier i think he's still on he was testing with a game with me and stuff and he was saying how he left his really good pilot back because he knew there was this veteran coming uh, you know and i'm like hmm, i don't want that to happen anymore so stuka we did the bogey nobody rule and that's been really really good you know you'd figure you figured a veteran pilot would be at the forefront man you know uh yeah you know i know you don't want to lose yeah. him but i mean come on Right. Well, it's actually a really good illustration, I think, of how to design uh, to, reinf uh, to reinforce historical behavior and or uh, disincentivize dumb behavior. Right. That, that, you know, you can call it gaming the game. I don't, want, I don't want people to be able to game the game. I want them to have to play the game. And, yeah, if you make a mistake and you have the wrong pilot fighting that, well, you might suffer a loss. But... Your newbie also could, thanks to the dogfight board and everything else, your newbie may pull out a miracle. You never know. Now, we were talking about Stuka Leader, and you said you don't know what bogey is going to come up, and it could be a, a, a BF-109, but I thought Stuka Leader was on 
uh, the view from the stuka. Yeah, yeah I, so have the to, I have to apologize because my head is on Mustang Leader. <laughs> ah. So in Mustang Leader, in Mustang Leader, the bandits are German aircraft. But you're you're right. Um, you would be running into a Mustang, and you're you're in a 109, not a Fock Wolf or uh, or a jet. You know that, that kind of thing. You, you, you never know what's coming at you. So you see that already? I, you didn't catch that. I caught it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wait. Damn right, Dan. I'm pushing yeah. buttons. I'm running the show here. I'm the, the backstage producer too, Dan. That's I'm, tell, I'm telling you. Guns, I, I, I'm I telling just you. found another play tester. If you find stuff like that. There you go. I, 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 you know what? I'm actually good at finding little stupid stuff like that. But when you're asking me to play test, because I, I have a very short attention span, Chuck. And He's an amazing play tester, but he'll... Boy, his emails will be totally incoherent. I'm telling you, the squirrels are going by all the time. You know what I'm telling you? Squirrel. I can't do it, man. They're Canadian yeah, squirrels, though. Hey, so, Chuck, um, Mustang Leader, yes. that, that's that's your next baby, but I'm sure you have about seven other games on the on the table. That you're, that you're, and the thing is, is that are they all going to be DVG-type games? Um, pretty much, yeah. Um, might not. And it, the ones that might not, you know, I've got some racing game ideas because that's another thing that I love to do. I love racing and I love that type of thing. So I've got a racing idea that may turn mm. out to not be DVG. However, I get it. I've I got get ideas it. on how to make it a leader game where you have to control, you have to put together your team <laughs> and go out there and do that kind of stuff. Um, I've got a fire, fire, fire fighter game that's hmm. uh, in the back here that's going to be coming up after Mustang. And so I've got a, a bunch of different kinds of things, you know. A firefighter game? Yeah. Um, do right you now, know? Because, uh, go, ahead, go ahead, Chuck. Do you okay, know? Right now, well, <laughs> you first. And now we're chuching. Okay. Uh, 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 Artie, who's that? Who's uh, Micro Design? Ke um, Paul Robo. No, Kerry. Kerry. Uh, Kerry Anderson. Do you know Kerry Anderson, Chuck? I do not. Um, it, it's a Micro Design Group, I think. Micro Game Design Group, I believe. Micro Game Design Group, and he's got a firefighter game, but it's like a folio game that came out many years ago, and uh, basically it's a war game. You're fighting fires, this and that, because I think he was. A ranger, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. He's all kinds, this guy. Uh, um, what's his face Carrie. again? Gary. Gary Anderson. Yep. Not the animation yeah, I, guy. That was Jerry Anderson. With the, I've with actually the seen it. I think I've seen that one in just some of the back art, background I'm doing. But obviously this will be a bit different. I'm planning on uh, talking to three or four fire chiefs in my mm. area. I've got where I live now. There's a volunteer fire department that's not very big. And then I've got the city that I'm close to has a full-time fire department that's bigger. And then, of course, Milwaukee's got this huge fire department. So I want to talk to them and get some ideas and do different kinds of things. So that's a ways off yet. I want to get Mustang Leader on people's tables and, and uh, move these other ones forward after that. You have any other Leader games for DVG? Oh, yeah. Some fine yeah. ideas have come out in the chat here, let me tell you. Yeah. No, Kamikaze we, we, Leader, it's a very short campaign. <laughs> I saw that. We have Kamikazes in Zero Leader, by the way. You can, uh, <laughs> the Oka Bomb is in there, and you can also assign anybody in your squadron to be a Kamikaze pilot if you want to. Huh. Um, but I've got, uh, there's been a lot of requests for Spitfire Leader or something mm -hmm. with British aircraft and everything else. So that's that was gonna be my that was gonna be the one right after Mustang, but it might get bounced back for another design of mine. But at this point, that one is right there, and that's gonna be a lot of fun because in Mustang Leader, the Americans really only flew three airplanes: the P-38, the P-47, and the P-51. Uh, but for Spitfire, they flew Hurricane, Spitfires, Defiance, you know, all of these all these types of aircraft. So it'll be a whole lot of fun to design all of those. 
Whatever okay. you do, uh, just don't make the uh, British upset by only including in the game the Spitfires that were flown by Americans. <laughs> there you go. The, the Eagle Squad, the Eagle Squadron expansion is for Mustang Leader. That and Tuskegee Airmen. Mm. Okay, be that'd be a good one. Yeah, Ben Rawlings, my artist, is already working on uh, the Red Tails, the Mustangs for their uh, for their squadron and everything else. So that's going to be really cool too. You know, you made me think. What about the um... What were the uh, the, <clears throat> the Chinese, the Americans who joined in that to, to bomb to bomb the Japanese and China uh, tiger leader? Flying tigers. Oh, fine, oh there you go. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, Isn't is there a? Uh, going to be going to the printers just about any time now. They're finishing up oh. some cards and that kind of stuff. Flying tigers leader by Russ Lance. That's fantastic. No, he's been working on that for a while. Um, I helped him out a little bit on it, and he's got he's got some great ideas. So, uh, uh, Chuck, uh, sorry, Artie, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm. No, no, sure. go ahead. That's a ter that's a terrific idea, though, Dan. I'm glad you you and some other people had it. No, yep. well, I'm not getting nothing out it. of it now. That's all right. Yeah, uh, Chuck, all these leader games. Yes, they all have their little twerks, this and this and that. But um, yeah. it being the I'm going to say the same system. It's it's not the same system, but following the same type of mechanics. Um, right. How do you choose a leader game? It's is it based on on um, preference? For me, it is. Um, that's why Zero Leader was the first um, because I wanted to. I love the Japanese aircraft. Uh, I love all of the World War II aircraft, but the Japanese aircraft really interested me. And we had Corsair Leader already out. So basically, I just put a mirror up to Corsair Leader and said, okay, what do I need for Zero Leader? But I did, I mean, I added a bunch of stuff to it, and I add a bunch of stuff to each one that comes up. But that's why Zero Leader became uh, my first choice. And then it's a, just a matter of doing a nation, you know, doing uh, Germany and now America, and we're going to do England. That type of thing. Um, what about the and, Russians, man? Um, I'm actually in conversation with the guy who is... He was going to start that the same time I started Stuka Leader. He was going to start... <laughs> Yak-9 Eastern, Leader. The Eastern Front one. Uh, Stormovic Leader. Stormovic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he got taken off and doing a bunch of other things and everything else. And actually, I've just been in contact with him in the last uh, week. Or whatever, uh, so he's probably getting that all put together again. Isn't the Sturmovic a little bit like the A10, uh, the the Warhog yes. in terms of yes. it being uh, un unsinkable? Correct. And it's a two seater, Before right? I, I warned you about one of my black ones. Uh oh, there's one. <laughs> black Cat Leader. Yep. Uh, that board gaming geezer on uh, zero leader, there is head to head rules, so you can play zero leader versus Corsair leader. There you go. That's a great yep. idea. Some genius yep. came up with it. I, and I don't know who that genius might be, but he, he did have a problem getting DVG to go with that. Yeah. And and, and is there um, a defend Yam, um, Yamamoto? Is there a defend Yamamoto scenario in the, the zero okay. leader? Not in, not in per, not. One of the things that I had, I had a look at it from the Japanese side, and people are always like, well, you got to have Peppy Boyington and all that kind of stuff. Well, the Japanese didn't care who they were fighting. They were just going to Guadalcanal, or they were going wherever, and whoever they ran up against, they ran up against. So, you know, you could do a scenario where you've got to escort a couple of vetties across, across the board or doing whatever, but that isn't an actual scenario in the game. You know, Vincenzo from Italy, Reggio Ariono, uh, Arona, uh, Aeronautica leader. Huh? Well, Italians, come on. Uh, uh, they're in Stuka leader, and they're also going to be in Mustang leader. Mustang leader are the Vincenzo. bad guys, but in Stuka leader, there are, uh, there's plenty of them in the uh, in the game. There you go. You got your Reggio Aeronautica all set there. I didn't stumble over it as much as Dan did. So, Alan Salazar, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Dan, I'll send you half of this. 
Yeah, you're amazing. There you go. There you go. Wait, don't you owe me some money for something? No, you don't. You paid me already. One step you. towards your toilet repair. Yeah, that's you know, right. I mean, I, I even, uh, when I stopped doing drugs, I even, I owed my drug <laughs> de dealer money. I went to pay him, all right? When, when did no you stop doing drugs, Dan? Oh, about 45 minutes ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, this is a bad time to have stopped snorting cocaine. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, talking about Picked the wrong day to start stop sniffing glue. Yes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It try, it, it, the, um, the thing is with these zero liters and all that, it's yep. it, the amount of stuff that's in there is just insane. And, and, and don't you... <laughs> Don't you at one point want to say, okay, stop, let's put out the game because there's like tons of counters, tons of of, of, of uh, uh, scenario. Like when I say tons, I mean tons yeah. of scenarios. So the game weighs nine, the game weighs yes. nine pounds. Um, That's a lot. I when, I was going, when I was going through it, I mean, there's a million aircraft that could possibly That's have insane. made it into this game or whatever. And, you know, uh, finally, Kevin and I, we kept coming up with all these different ideas and doing all that kind of stuff. And finally, I just had to say, time out. But we yeah. have to. Nothing else can come in here. We just don't have room. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, there's no, I, you know, I think there's a great, op you passed this on, Dan, okay? Um, I think there's a great opportunity for DVG to really establish leadership in the space by introducing the six inch bookshelf box for organs. Yes. I'm just saying. Yeah. I buy, I don't care. Get, de, tell them I don't care what game he puts in the box, uh, but I'll buy it for the box. For the box. Well, the number one complaint that I've gotten about Zero and Stuka is that people cannot shut the box. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. There's just too much stuff in there. And you know, uh, personally, you get your money's worth in in uh, uh, buying a game like that because it's insane. What what is it like a hundred bucks when he does a? Uh, yep. You know, well, zero, bucks. They, they, they retail right now for one hundred and ten. But I, mean, I like to, but I may be biased, but I like to think that there's plenty of stuff in there. The oh man, are you kidding you've me? You've got the number of aircraft you've got and all that type of stuff. I mean, with Stuka Leader, I believe it's. If you went all in, you would end up with a total of like 30 campaigns and aircraft all over from the early JU-86 uh, all the way up to the jets, um, the America bomber and all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, there's there's tons of stuff in there that you can constantly be playing. So, Is, is there a problem with um, ME-262 leader? Is that doable? It, well, not I guess not anymore um, because one of the things with it is because it's so limited because at the end of the year, end of the war, there wasn't very much of it or anything like that. But that is one of the things when I, when I designed Stuka Leader is what do we what do we call it? Do we call it Messerschmitt 109 Leader? Do we call it Fock Wolf Leader? Do we what do we call it? And Stuka is just such a well known. Yeah name when you say Iconic. Stuka, boom, everybody knows what you're talking about you yeah know what that airplane is and you name it but uh so me 262 liter was one of the one of the things that had got bounced around whether we would do it or not but that was an, another one is coming up with rules with that because compared to the other airplanes those those airplanes were so fast so now i had to develop rules for those airplanes that can now move two areas rather than just one like all the other airplanes and uh, mm. how they can break off engagements whenever they want because they're just so fast what about the canadian yeah. avril leader avril <laughs> an avril lancaster yeah <laughs> yeah i mean the the the, uh, the the iconic british aircraft of i mean yeah i gotta give props to the lancaster too but the, the iconic british aircraft of the war is the spitfire right absolutely M maybe not even the iconic british aircraft right the the iconic aircraft of world yeah, yeah at least fighter aircraft. yep if you look uh if you look closely at my uh bogey no bogeys in stuka they are a spitfire um they're, they're, it's just such a well-known aircraft and everything else so Spitfire leader, I'm I'm very much looking excite, 
uh, looking forward to getting that going. And that's going to be another one, just like Mustang is going to tie in with Stuka. Uh, Spitfire is going to tie in with both of them. So you can, you can play them all. So how will uh, uh, Mustang leader differ from Corsair leader? The major difference and the thing that was one of the longest conversations was I'm taking in zero leader, Stuka leader, Corsair leader, all the leaders, you get a card that is a pilot and an airplane, right? And the, the, he stays in that airplane. He can only go up to his legendary level, but he's always in that airplane. Well, Mustang leader, that's not going to be true. You're going to have the pilots. Um, that are going to have all their stats. They're going to have a separate card, and then there's going to be separate cards for the aircraft, and you hmm. can assign them. So this will make it really easy for you to take your favorite pilot and start him in um, 1942 and flying maybe a P-38 or whatever, and then transfer him. A year later, get into 44, now he's going to fly a P-47, and then later on he's going to fly a P-51. But you can keep that guy moving and always in the most up-to-date aircraft, whereas like in Zero Leader or Stuka Leader, if you were an ME-109E pilot, you're an ME-109E pilot. So you are not, you wouldn't see action in 43, 4, and 5. And the same with Zero Leader. If you're an A6M2 Zero Leader or Zero Pilot, you're not going to see action from about 43 on. Um, but with Mustang Leader, because they're going to be separated, now you're going to be able to uh, take your favorite pilot or build a squadron of your favorite pilots and run them throughout the war, upgrading their aircraft as they go. Um, so, and that's an idea that I'm bouncing around too. It has not come to fruition quite yet, but there's going to be long-term, I'm thinking long-term campaigns. So, you are in the same campaign for the length of the war. Uh, hmm. One of my favorite ideas is to just be a fighter campaign. Um, all the other leaders, you have a mix of aircraft. You have fighters, bombers, you name it. Well, in this particular case, you would just have fighter aircraft. And all your missions are going to be escort, intercept, ground strafing, that kind of stuff. You won't be going after warehouses and all the types of things that fighter planes did not go after. So you're a true fighter squadron commander. And uh, that's a that's an idea that I'm I'm working on that hopefully I can make it work. These Chuck, sound like win-wins to me. Go ahead, Dan. Chuck, the, the zero leader, a zero was a fighter. It didn't carry any um any any bombs or anything, is that right? Armor. It didn't carry any it, armor either. Didn't have any armor. Um, it carried drop tanks. It could conceivably carry a small bomb, but that was not its purpose, and that's not the way the Japanese used it. What do you mean didn't carry any armor? What was it made of? Canvas? Paper. It was made, yeah. It, it's a, it was made in had metal and, and doped fabric and that type of stuff, but they did not. Their idea of building that airplane, because they knew they were going to be doing an, a Pacific campaign, island hopping and things like that, they wanted two things out of their aircraft. They wanted maneuverability and they wanted long range. Well, the only way they could do that was reducing weight. So they did not have self-sealing fuel tanks. They did not have armor to protect the pilot or anything like that, uh, which is why, you know, six machine guns from an F4F Wildcat tended to turn a zero into, um, yeah. <laughs> and debris. Yep. Yeah. And then the pilots didn't wear, they didn't wear um, Shoots. parachutes because they felt that that was too... Uh, confining inside the cockpit, but they also, part of their code, they couldn't surrender. So they they didn't wear parachutes. And the radios that they had, which hard to believe Japanese technology, but the radios they had were so crappy that they took them out to save the weight. So especially the fighter airplanes had no radios. So it was... So I, I don't was understand how... I don't understand how they were so uh, successful in their limitation, man. Well, because... The Americans, the Allies in general, okay, our airplanes were heavy, they were armored, they were doing all that kind of stuff, uh, but they couldn't maneuver for crap. So until some of these pilots learned the zoom and boom routine or the, the um, 
thatch weave, those kinds of things, until they learned those types of maneuvers, they were getting destroyed on a regular basis. If you tried to turn with a zero, and I don't care what kind of aircraft you were flying before the F6F Hellcat and later Corsairs, you tried to turn with a zero, you were dead in a, a turn or two because they're so maneuverable. And that's another thing that I did in zero leader that Corsair didn't have. I added maneuverability and robustness as stats on the airplanes. So a zero is very maneuverable, a Betty is not. Zeros blow up, a Betty does not, you know, those types of things. How does a zero blow up? It's a paper. Yeah, fuel, hit the fuel tank. It. The fuel tank goes, the, the engine sparks. Fuel tank go boom. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about the airplanes they flew. It's amazing that they even flew them. Unbelievable. Yep. I mean, yeah, I've it? never, oh, I don't think I've seen one in person. I don't know if there is one at the uh, Air Force Museum at Dayton. Um, I don't remember seeing uh, any Japanese aircraft there, actually. I'm not sure. I've, I live in uh, Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee. And mm -hmm. the Oshkosh EAA Air Museum is just mm -hmm. north of us. And that's got one. They've got a whole plethora of World War II aircraft. I just love it. My wife won't go up there with me anymore. Because I, <laughs> I get up there. I get up there and they... That's it. I'm lost. Uh, yeah, I, every time we've gone to the every time we've gone to the Air Force Museum at Dayton, my wife's had to drag me out of there at the end of the day. Yep. So it's like, okay, it's time we've had. Yeah, it. Yep. I, uh, nobody. Wants I don't to care. Do if, I don't care if you want to go walk around inside the B seventeen again. We're going home. <laughs> exactly. But 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 but. That's right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh man, I, I, I'm going to the the the, the, Can, um, the Canadian War Museum, which is about an hour and a half away from here. It's very and I small. I swear to God, I, I can't get I can't get anybody to come with me, man. Yep. Now they have, uh, if you're familiar with the Experimental Aircraft Association, they have their fly-in up here um, for about a week at the in August, and I have gotten a bunch of people to go with me once. And they, they will only go with me up there once because then we go up there, they're looking for places to eat and they're looking for places to shop. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to go look at these airplanes over here. And, uh, you know, we get up there at eight in the morning and it's about seven thirty eight o'clock at night and I'm ready. To, I'm still wanting to stay there. And they're, they're all like, we've got to go home. I think my youngest daughter, she's grown now. But she has a t-shirt from when she was a kid that said, I survived the EAA. Oh, um, come on. Yeah. Bloody hell. Yeah. But that's 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 me. I love it. And it's I just love that that time because it wasn't I, honestly just before this happened I was I was watching um uh, uh Top Gun Maverick mm. again for the nine millionth time. And I, I don't want it I when I'm looking at it I like the idea of dogfighting, doing all that kind of stuff, just pressing a button and saying, boom, you're dead. Not so much fun. But I'm, uh, I'm, 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 the Chuck, how much dogfighting can you do in a in an F-35 or an F-22? Well, that's the thing. But if you think back to, like, Vietnam era, they did not believe that there would ever be dogfighting again. So, like, the early Phantoms didn't have guns. They only had rockets. And suddenly you get into a dogfight with a mate that has 20 millimeter cannons. You're going, oh shit, this is not good. Right. You know, I, I, I gotta, I gotta extend in order to launch a missile at them or do whatever. So they retrofitted, they made it work, and that's where that's where Top Gun came from, because they were losing pilots to these dogfights where the enemy would get in close and you couldn't use your missiles. So they had to teach their pilots how to do dogfights. And it's so the same thing. In World so, War II, uh, in World War II. So Top Gun Maverick is a movie to watch. Oh, the the original Top Gun was amazing, but the Top Gun Maverick is even better than that. Jeez, my I, my, my, I, my daughter I, loved it. Oh, I actually haven't watched it yet. Uh, I, I got to get to it? it. It's on uh, really? either Amazon or Netflix net right <laughs> now. So. Yeah. Oh, the original the original one I used to watch so much, and I would have the volume turned up. But again, my youngest daughter, she was probably 12 
or 13. She was in her bedroom, which is on way on the other side of the house. And if you remember the original one, there's the scene where he's trying to get the the bogey at Top Gun, and he's trying to get it, and he's telling it, lock up, lock up. And when it locks up, you get that tone, and he yells, bingo. Well, I'm watching the movie. You get the tone, and my daughter in her bedroom yells out, bingo. <laughs> That's how many times I've watched that movie. She's She knew the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, man. Mm-hmm. Someone asked you, "What's your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite uh, World War II airplane, man?" Oh, I mean that that is so difficult because there's so many of them that are really, really cool. I'm kind of an underdog sort of guy. I love the F four F Wildcat because that turned out to be a really good airplane, although it really shouldn't have. Um, and the original one didn't have power retract, uh, um, landing gear retraction. You used to have to crank it and do all, but it's just such an ugly, really neat plane. But, but it was sh a short plane, right? It uh, was short. short. It was short and fat. A little funny story at Midway when the first, uh, TDF Avengers were coming to the, uh, island, the anti-aircraft guys were all told to just look for a pregnant F-4F Wildcat, and that's what the hmm. that's what the uh, TBF is going to look like. So they didn't shoot oh, any man. down, so it must have worked. But oh, I, I love that. I really like Fock Wolves. Um, I think the ME-262, if you get a front view of it, it just it looks exactly like a shark coming at you. I, it's um, beautiful, beautiful. A beautiful aircraft. And Made out of plywood. Is, isn't yes. it made out of plywood? Well, the, the 262 wasn't, but the 162 was. The, Vol the Volksjäger, the People's Fighter. And um, uh, I, I just thought about something, but um, my God. Well, while you're thinking about it, we've got a question here from Byron Salahor, whose name I probably still mispronounced. So, in your opinion, why are there so few games about Korean Air War? Such an interesting area. Uh, why are there so few Vietnam era air games, for that yes, matter? Yes, I like that. I like that. An awful lot of, I think, an awful lot of that reason is because the Korean War, not so much, but the Vietnam War definitely is that it's so fresh and it's so controversial that when you come out with these things, it's it's difficult. There are a couple of good um, good Vietnam War. Phantom Leader is an amazing yeah, Phantom game Leader. for the Vietnam War. Uh, Downtown, there's a couple other games Classic. that are really, really good games. Uh, but the Korean Air War, that is, a, that is a really good question because they started off flying propeller aircraft and they ended up flying these jets, you know, and yeah. the F-86 and that kind of stuff was just yeah. an amazing airplane. And there was dogfighting and there was rockets yeah. and there was uh, you know, SAR, search and rescue. And there was, I mean, the Korean Air War really has everything in a very um, basic way. You know what I mean? What's um, that American plane they called? The Starfighter? What is it? The... The F, well, the F-104 was a Starfighter. Like the the, the F-86 I... was the same. I used to see an Ultraman. When I watched Ultraman, <laughs> you, you would see the American planes and they were like, they, they they had an open uh, nose. Yep. yep. You're thinking you're you I think you're thinking about the F eighty six saber. Saber. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't know. Don't ask me. Yep. Um, they also uh, the China, or the North Koreans slash Russians were were flying their MiG fifteens and such were actually. Um, in Stuka later, one of the what if aircraft is the Focke Wolf TA 183, which hmm. when you look at it will go, wait a minute, that's a MiG 15. What's that doing here? So I guess we know which one of the engineers the Russians got at the end of the war. <laughs> hey Chuck, Saber Leader, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if anybody has that down, but that is that's an awesome idea because Oops. for the Korean the Korean War, like I say, there's so many things. Wasn't Apparently, there was a, a Huey leader in the works at one point. It's been in the works for a long, long time. Um, I guess it's a little 
a little inside whatever, but I have asked a couple times if I could do that game. And oh, well, there you go. I guess, I guess somebody is assigned to it, and it isn't, uh, it's not me. <laughs> okay. And I, I think that would be very, very cool. And my graphic artist, Vladimir um, Dudish, and my artist, Ben Rawlings, we could have so much fun with that game. You know, <laughs> designing them and doing all it would just be so much fun. Um, and we're having a blast in uh, for Mustang Leader and everything else. We just finished actually the side of the box. It was a gentleman that I was told I should contact, and I talked to him. He's written a book. He's looking for a publisher. He's written a book about his father's exploits in World War II as a P-51 pilot. Hmm. And he had some exploits up on Facebook in the uh, 8th Air Force group, but they were really cool. So I contacted him, got some information for him, and his father's airplane is going to be the side of our of our box. Is going to be the view of his father's airplane. How uh, cool is that? Made up this really cool poster kind of thing with his airplane and his picture and all this kind of stuff. So we're having a lot of fun with Mustang. We had a blast with Stuka. So the yeah, P fifty one was was that forty four on P fifty one? Yeah, the Mustang. Technically, the Mustang in the B version was out in forty three. Uh, they called it the birdcage at that time because it didn't the, you, the the bubble canopy that you're used to is the P-51D and on. That was 44 and later. Uh, but before that, they had a B. And they actually had a uh, ground attack version of it, which is the A-36 Apache. That was the Mustang with the original, uh, what is that engine? It wasn't the Merlin engine. I think it was an Allison didn't develop any power except at low altitude, so they turned it into a ground attack aircraft. What's so special about the Merlin engine? I hear just the Merlin, the Merlin, the Merlin. Well, it's named after a wizard, Dan. It's Absolutely. obviously awesome. Come on, get with it. <laughs> uh, power to weight ratio, uh, dependability, all these types of things. It was just an amazing engine. And really? Fuel mileage. I mean, that's why Mustangs could go all the way to Berlin, you know. Yeah, they, they had uh, drop tanks, which helped them, but they could go all the way to Berlin, linger just outside of the flak range, and then follow the bombers home again. So that was all 100% Merlin engine. That's the reason why those things could do that. And uh, That's uh, Rolls-Royce, is that right? Rolls-Royce, mm -hmm. yes. It was built under license by Packard. In, oh uh, wow! I used to work for I used to work for what Packard became, which was ah. um, uh, Delphi. Delphi. Which uh, they let me go right uh, about two years, maybe before they finally got out of their bankruptcy. Let me put it that way. Okay. okay. So, uh, but yeah, they used to be Packard, and some of the old timers there would still refer to the facility as Packard. Yep. So. Man, it's a dauntless, dauntless leader. Uh, uh, the possibilities are literally endless. I mean, they are endless. They're, they're endless. And it's one of the fun things about separating the pilots from the airplanes. Now, it's not a problem. Before, it was a problem to design an airplane that wasn't in the game. Because you had to design pilots, all this kind of stuff. Now, not so difficult because now you're just designing an airplane. So if suddenly somebody decides, uh, matter of fact, there is a gentleman who I've been working with a little bit, helping him out, doing different, answering his questions and everything else. He is separating the pilots and the airplanes in zero liter as a download uh, print and play. And uh, he is... Uh, Doing that, he's coming up with some airplanes that didn't make it into zero liter. There aren't very many of them, but there are some that didn't make it into zero liter, and he's actually working on them uh, for this print and play. So it's it's pretty cool to get some of the uh, night fighters and things like that that I couldn't put into zero liter. See, and that's a that's another really cool leader idea. Is I call it Knock Jaeger. So I've already got the bare bones of that worked out too. <laughs> and, uh, and then that's bogey, no bogey. Those all help, you know. Those all help out too for you know, uh, a night fighter 
Somebody Same suggested thing. SR seventy one Blackbird leader, but the comment went by so fast that I couldn't see it. So exactly. You know, saying 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 anything in German, um, it, it, there's an edge to it. There's an edge to it. You know. That's because they're all <laughs> shouting. Well, well, yeah. It's like it's like saying butterfly. Did you see that? Say butterfly. Schmetterling. <laughs> I probably just blew everybody's head off because I turned off auto adjust in the That's software hilarious. last night. Smithling! Cranken house! You know. <laughs> I love that video. I love it, man. I mean, the, the Italian is farfalla. The Spanish, <laughs> mariposa. And here come the German Schmetterling. What? <laughs> It's a classic. All right, folks, we are we are out of time. So I would like to thank everybody for coming. I'm having a great time. I I uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I'd like to thank Chuck for being our special guest, and I'd even like to thank Dan for taking ten dollars from the mouths of my many children. <laughs> so, all right, and cats. All right, everybody, have a great night. We will see you all next week. See you later. Quick move. Quick win.